Welcome. Welcome to this meeting of the Economic Society of Australia, Queensland Division. My name is Michael Knox, and I'm a past president of the Economic Society of Australia, Queensland Division. I'm also Chief Economist and Director of Strategy of Morgan's Financial Limited. It is my task here today to welcome Deputy Governor uh, Michelle Bullock and ask her to address us. Um, Michelle began her formal studies in economics in Armidale uh, in northern central New South Wales. I asked her early why, why she started in Armidale. Well, she lived in Armidale. She graduated with uh, an honours degree in economics from the University of New South Wales in 1984. She followed that up by travelling to near the boundary between Covent Garden and Holborn in central London. And here she graduated with a master's degree in science economics from the London School of Economics in 1989. Michelle had already joined the RBA in 1985 and served in various positions in the economic group and in the international department. In 1998, Michelle was promoted to Chief Manager Payments Policy Department. In 2007, she became Head of uh, Payments Policy Department. In 2010, she became Advisor Currency Group and Assistant Governor Currency. And in 2015, she became Assistant Governor of Business Services and then, importantly, in 2016, Assistant Governor of Financial System. And now, in 2022, Michelle was appointed Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Michelle was promoted to Deputy Governor at a time when other, other extremely brilliant women like her are advancing to the front rank of leadership in central banking. Four come to mind that I have seen present in person. Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland President Loretta Mester always presents with overwhelming confidence. I've always had the feeling that she understood the, the absolute detail of what she was trying to tell an audience. Apart from an in-depth understanding of key issues, the Cleveland Fed, under her leadership, has made important contributions to the market's understanding, the markets that I'm part of's understanding, of US CPI and its, with its monthly analysis of the median CPI and the 16% trimmed mean CPI. The next that always comes to mind for me is the wonderful Mary Daly. Uh, Mary Daly is President and Chief Executive of the San Francisco Fed. Physically tiny, and when she comes up uh, and speaks in, uh, to uh, a lectern like this, her head is just looking over the top of the, of, the, of the lectern, but physically tiny, Mary Daly fills up the room with enthusiasm and charisma as soon as she begins to speak. Overwhelming. She has a way of making complex ideas simple, she just does not, it's not just that she makes you believe her, it's that you want to believe her. She's wonderful. Carmen Reinhardt comes to mind. Carmen served as the chief of the World Bank in 2020 and 21. Carmen is known to many people through her collaboration with Ken Rogoff in her book, This Time It's Different which was a history of world financial crisis going back hundreds of years. I personally have learned more about the mechanisms and resolutions of financial crises from going to presentations given by Carmen Reinhardt than in any other way. She's currently running a course at uh, uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard, which is about this, this issue of financial crisis. Carmen presents hard realities with a toughness that I've always admired. May long she continue. And Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen went from chair of the Federal Reserve. She was always also previously president of the San Francisco Fed. She went from chair of the Federal Reserve to the, uh, to the 
Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. Now, the many things I could say about Janet Yellen and the presentations that I've seen her give, but I would simply say this. Rarely has a better human being held the position of Secretary of the US Treasury. And presenting to us today, we have Michelle Bullock, Deputy Governor of the RBA. At a previous presentation for Fincier in May, Michelle remarked about the problem of keeping stable coins stable. I may ask a question about that later in the discussion section after her address. While Michelle is speaking, please don't now note down your questions so that you have, ready, have them ready to ask following her presentation. After she finishes speaking, we will uh, move to the uh, area to, to my left uh, of, the le of the lectern. And I will ask a couple of questions to begin with and then open it up to questions from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to speak to you today, Michelle Bullock, Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. I'm not Mary Daly short, but I'm not uh, particularly tall either. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm not sure I quite live up to the stature of the ladies that you spoke about, but I'll, I'll do my very best. Um, <clears throat> so um, thank you all for coming today. It's great to be in person. Um, I've done quite a few over the uh, events over the last couple of years, and they've been on uh, video, and they are very, very tough. Um, it's tough to, to gauge your audience, it's tough to gauge whether you've got their interest or not. I just much prefer the in-person in events, so thank you all for turning up. It was actually only about nine months ago that I was actually speaking about the risks of a very buoyant housing market. Funding costs and interest rates were at historic lows. Housing prices were growing at a very fast pace, as I'm sure many of you know. And concerns were centred from our perspective on the potential macro financial risks that were stemming from high and rising levels of household debt. So to address some of those systemic risks, the Australian Prudential Regu Regulation Authority had announced an increase in the interest rate buffer that it expected banks to use in assessing potential borrowers. So that all seems like a long time ago. It wasn't really. Since then, uh, there's been a number of developments, obviously. The economy has turned out to be very resilient. Once pandemic restrictions were removed, the economy rebounded very strongly. Consumption of services has started to grow again, and the demand for goods at the same time has held up. The labour market is very tight, with the unemployment rate at multi-decade lows and vacancies at historical highs. As in many other countries, inflation in Australia has risen and it's now higher than it's been since the early 1990s. Global factors such as COVID-19 related supply disruptions and Russia's invasion of Ukraine account for much of this increase. But domestic price pressures here have also been building. And together this has contributed to the highest rate of core inflation for many years. So over recent months, therefore, the Reserve Bank Board has been withdrawing the extraordinary monetary policy stimulus that was initially put in place to support the economy, Australian economy, against the effects of the pandemic. The cash rate's been increased by 125 basis points since May. It's now at 1.35%. And the Board expects further increases in the cash rate will be needed in the months ahead. Now, just how high and how fast the cash rate is raised is going to depend on many factors. But in making this assessment, one of the areas the board will be closely observing is how households respond to the combination of rising interest rates and prices. And that's going to be uh, part of the topic of my uh, talk today. I'm going to talk about the implications of rising interest rates for the household sector. My focus is really going to be on the potential implications for financial stability. In our last couple of financial stability reviews, we've talked about the potential buildup of systemic risk as housing prices and credit grew very, very strongly through 2021. Now we're facing quite different circumstances. Interest rates are rising, 
housing prices and other asset prices are declining and inflation is increasing the cost of living for everyone. The effect of these developments on households and the way they respond will have implications not only for the broader economy, but they will also highlight financial vulnerabilities that have been building in the household sector. My focus here is going to be mainly on indebted homeowners. Around about a third of all households have housing debt. Now, I'm not suggesting here that other households are unaffected by rising interest rates and inflation. Clearly, there are going to be implications for renters and for those that own their own homes outright. But indebted households pose many more direct potential risks to the financial sector, direct risks as opposed to indirect risks. And as I've discussed previously in other speeches, uh, they might also react, households might also react to interest rate rises in ways that exaggerate housing prices and consumption cycles. So the impacts on and the reaction of indebted households to higher interest rates is going to be very important in understanding how the economy and the financial sector might be affected. So today I'll first set out some facts on household balance sheets at an aggregate level. Then I'll talk a little bit about the distribution of debt and where some of the vulnerabilities might lie. And finally, I'll present some simple scenarios on the potential financial impact of increasing interest rates. And I'll finish with a few concluding remarks. So first of all, a bit of scene setting. There we go. If you've been reading our financial stability reviews over the past few years, it's a big read, but I highly recommend it, uh, you would be familiar with the theme of high household debt. The, high, the household credit to income ratio is currently around 150%, and you can see that on this, on this graph. This is high relative to the early 1990s. You can see that most of the run-up was through the 1990s and the first half of the 2000s. And this reflected a combination of lower inflation, financial deregulation, a decline in real interest rates, and strong income growth, all of which allowed households to service higher levels of debt. So their debt to income ratios went up. Now, since then, it's remained relatively steady at a high level, as nominal incomes have largely kept pace with the increased debt. So this high level of debt held by households might on its own suggest that many households will face difficulties as interest rates rise. This might have implications for their ability to service the debt and the economy more broadly. However, there are a number of factors that suggest there's considerable resilience in the household sector to rising interest rates. So the first point is that household, aggregate, in aggregate, household balance sheets are actually in very good shape. So while households have high levels of debt, this is accompanied by sizeable holding of assets, as you can see in this graph. On the left panel, you can see that assets have risen quite substantially. Strong growth in housing prices over 2021 and early 22 has boosted asset values for many homeowners, and housing assets now comprise around half of all household assets. The small decline in housing prices in recent months, at least in uh, Victoria and New South Wales, maybe not so much in Queensland, um, that's only marginally eroded some of the very large increases seen over the past few years. Furthermore, households have saved a lot of money since the onset of the pandemic, around about $260 billion, uh, and that's around about 3 to 3.5% of disposable income. These savings have been put into redraw facilities as well as offset and deposit accounts. This, this, actually, this behaviour reflects a couple of factors. First, the considerable government support that was provided to households and their employers during the pandemic. This meant that incomes held up very well, even through the pandemic. The banking system also helped households and businesses to weather the crisis by providing payment holidays and working with their customers to recommence repayments as their situation permitted. And both of these factors were very good for household cash flows. At the same time, consumption opportunities were curtailed, particularly for discretionary services. You'd all know that. I couldn't get a haircut for four months. It drove me nuts. So even though expenditure on goods has increased, households were still spending less than they were prior to the pandemic. And as a result, the household saving rate 
rose sharply. And many households therefore, therefore built up very large liquidity buffers, including those households with mortgages. Very low interest rates also helped many households to add to their savings through reduced interest payments. Since the start of the pandemic, payments into offset and redraw accounts on your mortgages have been substantial. And as I said earlier, they've totaled around about 3.5% of disposable income, as you can see in this chart here. The accumulated stock of these savings could help to ease the transition to higher mortgage payments for many borrowers, and that would allow them to sustain higher levels of consumption than might otherwise be the case in the current environment. This large stock of mortgage prepayments is relevant to our assessment of household indebtedness and the risks that it presents. Large buffers allow households to smooth their spending and maintain required debt payments when faced with lower incomes or cash flows or higher expenses. In fact, if we take these savings into account, you'll see that the ratio of household credit to income is actually a fair bit lower than the headline figure that I showed earlier. It's around about the same as it was in 2007, but it's substantially, um, it's risen over time and it's substantially lower um, than the headline figure. Now this is all at an aggregate level, but we also see similar trends from a disaggregate data on individual mortgages, and we can get this information from the Reserve Bank's securitisation database and from survey data. The ratio of liquid assets to income has increased substantially among indebted households over recent decades, and the borrowers with the most debt also tend to have the highest liquidity buffers, so that's good for financial stability. Among households with variable, variable rate owner-occupied mortgage debt, around half have accumulated enough prepayments into offset accounts and redraw to service their current loan repayments for almost two years or longer. So they've got a lot of spare capacity there. And these payment buffers will help to protect against a risk that as interest rate rises, households will find themselves unable to meet their debt repayments. Now, the second thing um, that gives a little bit of confidence is that the strength of lending standards in recent years actually gives us a bit of confidence that many households will be able to absorb some increase in interest rates. For many years, as some of you would know, banks have been required to stress test some increase in interest rates um, against uh, borrowers' ability to service um, their debt. So basically, they have to assess whether they can service the debt, not at the current interest rate they're paying, but if the interest rate was a few percentage points higher than that. So in 2019, the Prudential Regulation Authority indicated to banks that in assessing loan applications, it expected them to apply this serviceability buffer of at least 2.5 percentage points. So your current loan rate plus 2.5 percentage points, that's what you had to be able to service. And then in October 2021, um, as I indicated earlier, they increased this to a minimum of three percentage points. So as a result, a lot of borrowers should have some spare servicing capacity already built into their financial margins. And, and a final reason for um, thinking that they're reasonably resilient is that the household sector as a whole has acquired sizeable equity via house price rises in recent years. Rising housing prices have benefited borrowers with existing mortgages. Furthermore, the share of new borrowers that have borrowed at high loan to valuation ratios has declined markedly. The combination of these factors means that the share of loan balances in negative equity was around about 0.1% in May 2022, down from around 2.25% prior to the pandemic. And you can see in this graph, this is the distribution of outstanding loan to valuation ratios. And you can see that in May 2022, there are hardly any which have an outstanding LVR of over 100%. While housing prices have started falling in recent months, they would actually have to fall a fair way for neg negative equity to become a systemic concern. So some scenario analysis based on loan level data suggests that a decline in housing prices of 10% 
would raise the share of balances in negative equity to 0.4%. So it shifts the curve a little bit to the right. It's still much lower than its peak of 3.25% in 2019. Even a fall of 20% in housing prices would only increase the share of balances in negative equity to around 2.5%. So this low incidence of negative equity reduces the likelihood that borrowers will enter into default, as well as the size of losses incurred by the banks and the lenders if they did fall into default. Now, so far I've focused on household debt in aggregate, and the point that there are a number of factors supporting that, suggesting that indebted households will be quite resilient to at least some rise in interest rates. But as we all know, not all borrowers are alike, and the distribution here also matters. So in particular, what do we know about the incomes of the people that hold the debt? If we look at households that have the most debt, almost three quarters of debt outstanding is held by households in the top 40% of the income distribution. Indebted households in the bottom 20% of the income distribution hold less than 5% of the debt. Furthermore, households with high debt to income ratios who might be most affected by a rise in interest rates also tend to be high income households. And you can see that on the right hand side of this graph. Higher income households can typically devote a higher share of their incomes to debt servicing because their other living expenses tend to account for a smaller share of their income. This suggests, on the face of it, that there's a large number of households that are likely to be able to handle somewhat higher interest rates. Nevertheless, some households are more likely to face financial stress than others. Highly indebted households are particularly vulnerable in the event of a loss of income through higher inflation, particularly if combined with higher interest rates and a decrease in housing prices. Recent borrowers in the last year or so are more vulnerable than earlier borrowers because they're more likely to have borrowed at high debt to income ratios. And they're also more likely to have had their serviceability assessed at lower interest rates because interest rates were very low uh, back in, 19, in uh, 2020 and 2021. They had larger interest rate buffers, but they were still coming off low bases. They've also had less time to accumulate equity and liquidity buffers. Government policies to improve housing market accessibility for first home buyers during the pandemic also means that first home buyers are more highly represented among this group of recent borrowers than they are in earlier groups of borrowers. Historically, first home buyers have tended to have persistently higher loan to valuation ratios and lower liquidity buffers than other borrowers, and that makes them more vulnerable to a given house price or cash flow shock. The increase in high debt to income borrowing is one area that raises concerns as, as, as interest rates rise. While lending standards have generally improved over recent years, the latest housing cycle saw a significant increase in the share of loans at high debt to income ratios above six. And you can see that on, on this graph here, it peaked at nearly 25% of new loans. This partly reflected the very low interest rates at the time, and hence the belief that the debt servicing burden of these loans was manageable. Now on the face of it, these loans are, are more risky than loans at lower debt to income ratios, because if a borrower was to experience a fall in income or an increase in expenses, they might find it more difficult to service the loan. And in an environment of increasing interest rates, there is a risk that households with high debt to income ratios will find it more difficult to service their debt. <clears throat> but we also know other characteristics matter as well as the high de as debt to income ratios. In particular, the size of liquidity buffers and the income and wealth of the borrower also impacts the riskiness of the loan and the probability of the borrower ending up in financial difficulty. Broadly, you can say that investors with high debt to income loans are more likely than other borrowers to have high liquidity buffers. They also tend to be wealthier and they tend to have higher incomes. So this particular group of borrowers with high debt to income ratios has historically been less likely to experience mortgage stress than other borrowers. But on the other end, there's a group of borrowers with high debt to income loans 
that have lower liquidity buffers and lower incomes. And these borrowers are the ones that are much more at risk of mortgage stress. So the bottom line of all of this is that high debt to income lending is something to watch and, and the amount of it is something to watch. But in and of itself, a high debt to income loan is not necessarily more risky in a rising interest rate environment. <clears throat> So this is all very well, but what can we say about the impact of interest rate rises on individual borrowers? We can do a little bit of, an, um, we have data on individual anonymised loans from our securitisation database, and we can use that to do some scenario analysis on the potential impact of interest rate rises on the borrowers in that data set. Now, for the purposes of this analysis, we assume that variable mortgage rates rise by around 300 basis points from their low, which is broadly informed by recent market pricing to mid-2023. And the data suggest that over one third of variable rate borrowers have already been making average monthly loan payments, and that includes irregular payments to redraw and offset accounts, They've already been making enough payments sufficient to meet the resulting rise in required repayments. And that's that grey bar on the left-hand side there. In other words, there's probably limited impact on those borrowers of a rise in interest rates of around about 300 basis points. On the other hand, you can see the blue bar on the right. Just under 30% of borrowers would face relatively large repayment increases of more than 40% of their current payments. So another issue we've been thinking about is whether borrowers that took advantage of very low interest rates on fixed rate products in recent years are particularly susceptible to higher interest payments when fixed rate terms expire. The extremely low interest rates on these products through 20 and 21 led many people to take them up, resulting in the share of housing credit on fixed mortgage rates increasing from 20% at the start of 2020 to a peak of nearly 40% in 2022. The majority of currently outstanding fixed rate loans are due to roll off in the next two years. And that's sort of on the bottom panel, you can see how they're tending to expire over the next couple of years. So these borrowers are actually shielded from the time being from interest rate rises. But what is the potential impact when they do roll off? So again, we can use information from our securitisation database and some assumptions about the potential path of interest rate increases. And we can get an idea of the magnitude of the impact on these particular borrowers' payments as their fixed rates roll off. Now, if we assume that all fixed rates roll off onto variable mortgage rates, and the new variable rates are, again, broadly informed by the current market pricing, estimates suggest that around half of fixed rate loans by number would face an increase in payments of at least 40%. That's what this graph shows on our left panel. Borrowers with fixed rate loans that are due to expire the end of 2023 would experience a median increase of around about $650 in their monthly repayments. And you can see that on the right-hand side of that graph. This is slightly more than the rise in payments that variable rate borrowers would experience over this time, but it's not greatly. Uh, more. So these scenarios suggest large increases in debt servicing for many of those with expiring fixed rate loans. But unlike borrowers who hold variable rate loans, we have very little visibility of how much saving those with fixed rate loans have been doing in recent years. You'll recall I talked about offset and redraw on the variable rate. We don't have that visibility because many of the borrowers for fixed rate have contractual restrictions on their ability to channel their savings into mortgage prepayments. But given the very low interest payments and the broad-based increase in household savings rates, it is likely that many of these borrowers will have accumulated savings outside their mortgages ahead of any potential increase in repayments. Some borrowers also have split loans, so they have part variable, part fixed, and that will have allowed them to uh, accumulate buffers on the variable part of the loan. And some fixed rate loans also allow borrowers to at least have some excess repayments. So to the extent that all of these things are the case, it's like for variable rate borrowers likely to mitigate the rise in debt servicing requirements. Now it's important to note that these scenarios don't take into account future economic conditions. 
At the moment, for example, employment is growing strongly and unemployment is at its lowest level in nearly 50 years. Having a job is the best way of ensuring you can continue to meet repayments on your loan. How much the Reserve Bank Board decides to raise rates is going to depend on developments in the economy, including how borrowers respond to higher rates, and we'll continue to assess where the risks might materialise in this environment. So in the title of this speech, I posed the question, how are households placed for interest rate increases? There are a number of ways to come at this question, aggregate data, disaggregated data, and the last bit I did on scenarios. On balance though, I would conclude that as a whole, households are in a fairly good position. The sector as a whole has large liquidity buffers. Most households have substantial equity in their housing assets and lending standards in recent years have been more prudent and have built in large buffers for interest rate increases. Much of the debt is held by high income households that have the ability to service their debt and many borrowers are already making repayments well above what is required. And furthermore, those on very low fixed rate loans have some time to prepare themselves for higher interest rates. So while in aggregate it seems unlikely there will be a substantial financial stability risks arising from the household sector, risks are a little elevated. Some households will find interest rate rises impacting their debt servicing burden and cash flow. While the current strong growth in employment means people will have jobs to service their mortgages, the way the risks play out will be influenced by the future path of employment growth. And this, along with the board's assessment of the outlook for inflation, will be important considerations in deciding the size and timing of further interest rate increases. So thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. I'll uh, start um, by asking the De Deputy Governor a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to uh, uh, questions from the floor. There will be a couple of uh, roving mics moving around um, so that uh, uh, please signal for that roving mic and then um, um, uh, it will come to you you can stand up and ask your questions. So, but first I get my go. Um, so, um, Michelle, at the American Economics Association annual convention uh, this year, which was virtual, you know, for the second year, next year it won't be virtual, um, Raghur Rajan, who uh, was previously um, uh, chief economist of the IMF, who forecast the financial crisis, and then he became uh, governor of the Reserve Bank of India, uh, he um, talked about stable coins and uh, you previously uh, spoke at, about stable coins at the, at the Fincia presentation. Uh, and he said that they behaved, they were, they were like uh, 19th century American banks, uh, unlicensed banks, unregulated banks, and that he forecast uh, back in January uh, that we would see runs on these stable coins. And, and indeed, just like he forecast the financial crisis, he correctly forecast that. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, in, your, in your presentation of Fincia, you said that these stable coins aren't big enough yet to have caused, to cause a financial crisis. Mm. But I, that, what that says to me is that as they get bigger, they'll have to be regulated like banks. So, my, really, my question is, when, when do you think stable coins will get big enough that they'll have to be regulated like banks? <laughs> So I won't forecast specifically when that would happen, but I might make a couple of comments on um, what, what I think is going to happen with stable coins. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the crypto universe, I'm sure the younger people in the audience are, but um, we have um, crypto, cryptos like crypto assets, I won't call them coins because they're not money, um, like Bitcoin, um, and the value fluctuates very broadly. Stable coins were are supposed to have a stable link to um, something of value. It might be gold, it's most typically US dollars, there's a lot of US dollar stable coins. And the idea is that if you deposit uh, your money into that stable coin, you will get one US dollar in, you'll get one US dollar out, and it's supposed to work like that. That's in the sense in which it, it sounds like a deposit, it also sounds a little bit like a money market, uh, some sort of stable money market fund. Um, so, 
Uh, as we saw, they, are prone, they can be prone to runs. If people lose confidence and don't think that they're going to get their money back, it's every, every man and woman for, him, for themselves. Everyone wants their money out. They're not so big at the moment that um, they, they certainly caused harm to people. People have lost a lot of money. So there, there is still concerns um, on a consumer protection perspective. But in terms of financial stability, not so much yet. And, and the main reason for that is that they're not big and they don't have substantial links yet to the standard financial system. Um, but the regulators are on to this and um, it's already been decreed in the United States that stable coins will have, to, uh, will have to be issued by banks. They will not be able to be issued by others. Um, so people will have to be licensed to issue them. And uh, organisations like the Financial Stability Board, um, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, um, the Biz Committee on Payment and Market Infrastructures, they are all looking at how you might regulate stable coins as they get bigger because they start to look more like deposits. Um, so I can't tell you when they'll be big enough to have that, but I can tell you now the regulatory machinery is moving and I fully expect that in the next couple of years you will start to see regulatory regimes for stable coins. Um, so uh, usually um, from, from uh, your predecessors have always told me that about this point they anticipate that I'm going to ask the interest rate question. Yes. But I'm not, I'm not. Uh, since everybody else asks about interest rates, I'm going to ask about quantitative tightening instead. Mm -hmm. So there's event studies uh, being done both by the Federal Reserve, and I think there's some Australian work too, uh, but certainly US work, uh, which uh, estimates that the effect of quantitative tightening is uh, pretty small. It's only like 20, you know, a quarter of 1%. Uh, but it seems to me that what's happening both in, uh, in, with the Federal Reserve and, and even with the RBA, uh, that both of these central banks are running down a really big stock of debt, which is equal to a number of percent of GDP. Uh, I did some stuff on uh, a look at uh, what's happening in the US and the, the total of their sovereign debt and asset-backed securities are running down by... 4.6% of GDP every year. Well, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot bigger than a quarter of 1%. So mm. um, uh, surely, surely the effect must be bigger than 25 basis points. Yeah, so we've done some of our own estimates on um, what we think the impact of quantitative easing was. And, and they're not far off the 25 basis points, 30 basis points um, for the 200 billion of quantitative easing that we were doing. Recall though, and, and I don't think we have any reason to believe that it would be any uh, different on the way up. Recall though that when we were doing quantitative easing, we had no room to move on the interest rate. It was at the effective lower bound. On the way up, um, there is, there is, we, we're not limited by the effective upper bound. We can oh. increase interest rates to the extent we need to. So that's by way of saying that um, while I don't think uh, quantitative tightening it would have some impact, but it'd be relatively marginal. The main interest rate, the interest rate is the main monetary policy tool, and it's the one that will have the most impact. Um, quantitate, the way that we have described what we'll be doing is just uh, letting uh, bonds run off as they mature, so there will be a gradual tightening, if you like, um, over as the uh, balance sheet runs down, but I don't think we have any reason to expect that that is going to be... Um, anything more than marginal to the effect of interest rate rises. So that's my two questions. Are there any questions from the floor? Okay. So uh, if the microphones could move around to the, those putting up their hands. Thanks for your uh, time this afternoon, Ms. Bulk. I have two questions. Firstly, we're entering a phase of monetary policy tightening, it seems clear. Do you see wages rising over the near term? And if so, how helpful do you think that will be in cushioning the impact of the anticipated tightening? Referencing your point, though, that much debt's in high income household. Um, so I think um, we are observing that, that uh, wages are starting to rise a little more quickly. For those of you who study the Reserve Bank, you might recall that prior to the pandemic, um, 
the governor had expressed the view that if we were to have inflation permanently and convincingly within the target band, it required wage rises to be a bit more uh, than they currently were. They were running at about two and a half, two and a quarter percent. And um, I think uh, the, the rough rule of thumb is if, uh, if we've got productivity of around about one percent, um, then wa and wages should be able to rise by around about two and uh, three and a half percent, and inflation should be around about in the band. So, at the moment, I think we are seeing some rise in in wages, um, and that's not unexpected because we have a very tight labour market, and and that's what happens when um, demand for labour um, is uh, outstripping supply of labour, and we're starting to see some rise in interest rates. Um, and um, so I expect that we will be seeing some of that. I, I lost the microphone. Oh. So I can't do the second one. <laughs> okay, so who has the microphone now? Could they stand up, please? Actually, I was giving it back. Excellent. <laughs> um, do, is it possible that one of the drivers of the current low levels of unemployment resides in the fact that people during the pandem pandemic perhaps became capable of living on, say, 15, 20 hours a week, meeting their costs of living and so on. And so my question is, how much underpinning the unemployment rate do you think might be actually a mask for idle capacity for labour here already in the economy, i.e. before we open the international borders? And could we see uh, some relief to employers if the cost of living was to rise and drive people back out into the labour market so that those unworked hours became worked hours? Um, that's an interesting thesis. Um, I think the evidence, though, suggests that that's probably not what's happening. So full-time employment, for example, has risen by about 7% over the last year. We know that the um, unemployment rate is at a 50-year low. We know that the underemployment rate, so that adds in people who want more hours, is, is also at a, at a, at a reasonable low. Um, it's a bit difficult uh, looking at average hours work because it's been all over the place lately. Um, and it's all over the place because of the pandemic, people are off sick. There's still an elevated level of um, people that are not working because of sickness. Um, so. Um, the, data, the data are taking a while to settle, but I'd say that the little bits of partial we've got suggest that that's probably not what's going on. What's going on is there's really strong demand for goods, there's really strong demand for services. People are out there post-pandemic enjoying themselves. Um, and um, at the same time as uh, the borders have been shut and there's just been a, a big demand for labour. Table nine, was there someone in table nine who wanted to ask a question? Yes, okay, coming over. Hi, I'm Serene. Um, my question for you is, I'm trying to understand why Australia's following suit to what the, the rest of the world, US, Canada, New Zealand even, um, with their aggressive interest rate rises. Um, when you've just explained to us that we've got a tight labour market but we've got wage growth um, and the high inflation isn't really affecting how much uh, the our households can, I guess, um, what's the word? Be, they, they can um, meet the repayments even with the increases in interest rates. So, I mean, how, how much can our interest rate rises actually help battle this inflation if we're not really that... Yeah affected by it. Sure. Um, I wasn't meaning to give the impression that uh, interest rate rises won't impact people. Um, it will impact people. Um, it'll impact cash flows. Uh, it will impact, uh, if to the extent that housing prices start to decline a bit, it will affect people's feeling of wealth and, and that sometimes impacts as well. Um, so it will have an impact. Um, the point I think is good to remember like every other country, we're coming off emergency or extraordinarily low interest rates in this country. Much, much lower than you would have in a, in a normal, strong economy. And so at least the first task is to try and 
eliminate some of that monetary stimulus. So that's what we're trying to do. We've got demand for goods and services is above supply of goods and services. We've got to try and bring the demand back down. And interest rate rises will, as I said, have an impact on people's cash flow, their consumption at the margin, and that's going to help uh, bring those pressures down. So that, that's the mechanism through which we would typically, typically see it work. And other countries are doing similar because they've been in a similar position. Any other questions? Oh. Hey, Michelle, thanks for your time and the presentation. It was very enlightening. I'm a young guy, so I haven't seen much history. <laughs> and so it's nice to um, get your opinion on things. It might be a simple and silly question, but is there a part of the RBA that wants to increase rates enough to give us a buffer? Because there's whispers, obviously, of a downturn and recession. What, how much buffer do you want to prepare for something like that? No, no such, uh, no such thing as a silly question. Can I just clarify? I think what you mean is, um, do we want to increase interest rates so that we have the ability to drop them again? Yeah. If if we need to, is that what that's you're... That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's not something that we're sort of actively... At the moment, we're at, as I said, extraordinarily low interest rates, and we've got to get it up to some sort of concept of uh, what you might call... We call it neutral. We call it the neutral um, interest rate, which means it's neither expansionary nor contractionary. We don't know where that particularly is, but we know it's a fair bit higher than where we currently are. Um, so... That's the main focus at the moment. The focus isn't so much we've got to get them up in case we need to lower them again. Um, and in fact, in increasing them, um, we're just going to have to be alert to the many different complexities going on with household balance sheets, business balance sheets, um, in order to see the reactions and how inflation is going to respond. So um, I'd say that's not your question. Is, the answer is we're probably not really focused on that at the moment. We're much more focused on thinking about how, how do we get it up to a more neutral position. Sorry, I know you said you're not sure exactly where it is, but what do you, what do you think the neutral state should be? Well, it's, um, this, is the, this is the vexed question, and um, many countries have done a lot of work uh, on trying to understand what this might be. Our last piece of published work on this was in 2017, and we estimated it as a wide range of estimates, but we thought it might be real rate between, say, half a percentage point and one and a half percentage points, so somewhere in that, in that range. That's quite a range. And that's actually only the real component. The, the, um, the nominal interest rate that corresponds to that is going to depend on what inflation expectations are, and inflation expectations are very difficult to measure as well. So um, they're, the, they're our most recent estimates for it. Um, but again, it's really, really difficult. What we do know at the moment, though, is we're probably well below. Over there. Over there. There's a guy over here, too. Hi, um, thanks so much. Very comprehensive presentation. And um, I think it looks like um, a lot of stability there for the housing market and, of course, for financial stability. Uh, I guess there's a lot of young people in the room and uh, and it does seem that you know, house prices to income are very different to what they were 20 years ago. And it's almost an inequality type question that's there. So I'm interested in your thoughts around you know, that sort of inequality and, and maybe if there's any impacts there on financial stability. Not so much. It, it, look, it, it's, a, it's a very valid question and I know it gets asked a lot. It, it's not in relation to financial stability so much. I think it is very much an a, a quality, inequality issue. Um, one thing that happened during the pandemic, of course, was that uh, first home buyers, in fact, did come into the market quite a lot. Um, I think um, it's, not re it's not within the remit of the bank, but um, a lot of the things that need to be looked at in terms of um, housing market, housing prices, relate to issues of supply as well as demand. And there's not, not much we can do about supply. Um, interest rates impact demand, but um, there's a whole plethora of things that, that impact supply, including government policies, planning, infrastructure, all these sorts of things. Um, 
And um, I think that is something that um, possibly taxation, all these things are things that I think need to be thought about holistically. Um, if, as a society, um, we think that um, there are issues here for uh, first home buyers. Thank you, Michelle. My question really relates to uh, how people do respond and so on, yeah. and uh, the view that uh, the Reserve Bank has on uh, the period of time that the people have not had any time to respond and uh, their consumption has reduced dramatically, whereas we have a look forward, and I would expect over the next one year, most of that pent-up demand will have been uh, used up, dissipated. Yep. So in accounting for that, how do you actually moderate your interest rate increases so that it comes out with a normally smooth run instead of a huge bump? Yeah, look, um, that in fact is the challenge. And um, I think the governor's used the expression, there's a narrow path here. Um, that's also why, um, as I said, we're going to have to be looking at the data. We're going to have to be looking at what people are doing with their consumption. Um, how it's impacting them in terms of their cash flow, um, their demand. You're right, it might be that, uh, that once we get over this pent-up hump, people pull back quite a lot and that, that won't be good. And that, that sort of information is the sort of thing that's going to be relevant for us in considering um, how high and how fast interest rates have to rise. Taking into account the point I made earlier that interest rates are so low at the moment that they had to come up from those extraordinary low rates. Could you just comment on just what's happening with energy? I'm sorry, I'm just here. Oh, there you just are. Here. <laughs> so you've got $100 oil and reasonably low Aussie dollar mm. and the cost of everything like building materials, I think 90% of the cost mm. is energy. Yeah. How do you guys consider that when factoring your rate moves? Yeah, look, um, the energy issue isn't just an issue here, clearly. It's an issue all around the world at the moment um, and we all know the reasons for that. Um, the way we, we would think about it is that a one-off jump in energy costs, yes, it contributes to inflation for that period, but if they just stay there, or they come off a lot, a little bit, they're not contributing to inflation anymore directly. The question is, um, the longer it goes on, does it start to feed indirectly into, as you mentioned, the input costs? Um, so, in thinking about our decisions, what we're trying to think about is the extent to which these energy price rises might start to result in changes in inflation psychology, so that businesses are thinking, well, prices are just going up and up and up, and consumers are thinking prices are just going up and up and up. If that psychology um, sets in, then that, that's of concern, because that would mean that inflation will stay higher for longer. So at least the point of some early interest rate rises is to try and make sure that that psychology doesn't get in, that the one-off price rises to, the, to a large extent remain one-off price rises. Um, and at least at this stage, our expectations are that um, in in going into next year, that inflation, the inflation stimulus will start to come off because in energy prices hopefully won't rise anymore. They've had a big jump up. Um, and, um, and they stabilise and maybe even come off a bit. But, but the point is that uh, a little bit of interest, increases in interest rates to try and make sure the psychology doesn't get in there is going to be important. Thank you very much for your questions. We, uh, we have to bring it to an end uh, there because uh, if we don't bring it to an end here, Michelle's going to miss her plane. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, we have to wrap it up in the next uh, uh, few minutes. So um, uh, that means that uh, our uh, Morgans, uh, Chief Executive Officer, uh, will uh, ask for a vote of thanks. Michelle, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is John Clifford. I'm the CEO of Morgans Financial. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, this important lunch today. Obviously, a lot of economists in the room with, our, um, with the ESA sponsoring. Uh, a lot of non-economists uh, and business community and uh, 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 some from the education sector. 
Uh, and uh, it's great to see a lot of questions, especially from our younger uh, members of the audience. Um, and I'm sure for some of you uh, who are at the very young stage, and I see some gentlemen from Ashgrove, I think it is here today. Great to see you guys. Um, many of you may not remember some things that we're talking about today, uh, such as uh, raising interest rates and falling house prices. And uh, you probably don't remember the Wallabies uh, beating the All Blacks either. Um, well, I think we've had some answers on the first two uh, today from uh, the Deputy Governor. Um, it, I haven't heard any comments on the third, but perhaps that can be uh, for another day. Uh, Morgan's is uh, proud uh, to again sponsor this event. And on behalf of all sponsors and attendees, I'd like to thank the Deputy Governor for her address today. Uh, I should also like to thank the Economic Society of Australia uh, for organising yet another uh, successful and important lunch uh, with a great, um, great attendees here today. And uh, why wouldn't we have a great audience, uh, certainly in this environment when certainly interest rates are on the front page are news. And certainly I think we've all detected that uh, increased interest in, uh, in rates. Uh, something certainly happened recently and everybody's talking about it. Uh, if, uh, you've uh, if you've caught an Uber or a taxi in recent uh, months, you've probably detected that where well, last year they were all talking about Bitcoin and their latest tech investment, uh, perhaps not going so well this year, uh, they're all starting to wonder where their mortgage rates uh, will finish. So I think that's always a good indication when your taxi drivers or, or Uber drivers are talking about uh, that sort of thing. Um, thank you, Deputy Governor, for your and the RBA's support for bringing an informed discussion to Queensland business, finance and education communities. Uh, given your commitments, uh, we are delighted and privileged that you've made the effort to come to Brisbane to present today. Uh, the RBA's ongoing support of this series of lunches is greatly appreciated. So your insights and more importantly, the opportunity to engage in discussion is highly valued by the Queensland business community and is evident by uh, all attending. Uh, if I could wrap up proceedings by uh, summing up what I heard today, and there was the question around how are households uh, placed to deal with uh, higher rates, I think what I heard was they're in a strong position, but there's lots of moving parts. So um, ladies and gentlemen, if you join me with me in thanking uh, Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Michelle Bullock. Thank you again. Good, great. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, John. Thanks, Morgan, a lot. Thanks, Michael. And of course, Michelle, for coming today. I just wanted to wrap up um, with a slide about our next event. Uh, and maybe it's relevant also to what we have been discussing. Basically, on the 9th of September, we're organizing an event about the impact of the Brisbane Olympics. That will have both supply and demand effects. And um, we are really looking forward in Brisbane to see the effects. But um, Janelle Wilson from Knight Frank and um, uh, Ryan Murphy from the Bris Brisbane City Council will be meeting in um, Morgan's, I believe. And they will have a discussion. So please keep an eye on your emails. And uh, there will be more information about the details. Um, there are other events, of course, going on, but of course you will be getting them also through your email. Thanks again, and have a good day. <laughs>